What if I told you that quaternions, those mysterious four-dimensional numbers that power 3D graphics, spacecraft navigation, and even virtual reality, can actually be discovered using nothing but basic algebra? Today, we're going to derive them systematically using two powerful methods. The first method. Let's begin with what we already know, complex numbers. A complex number is usually written as a plus b times i, where i is the square root of negative 1. In other words, i squared equals negative 1. Now let's get adventurous. What happens if we take this complex number and multiply it by a brand new imaginary unit? Let's call this new unit r, and we'll say that r squared also equals negative 1. So if we define our new number, let's call it n as the product of z and r, where z is our complex number a plus b times i, then n becomes a times r plus b times i times r. Now what is i times r? If we assume that i and r commute, that is that i times r equals r times i, then n just becomes r times the original complex number z. That would be kind of boring. It's just a scaled version of r. Nothing new is happening. To make this interesting, we need to assume that i times r does not equal r times i. In other words, they don't commute. So let's define a new entity. We'll call it j and say that j is equal to i times r. Now our number n becomes a times r plus b times j. Nice. But before we get too excited, we have to make sure that we can multiply two such numbers without breaking the system. Let's multiply two such numbers. Let's call the first one n un equal to a times r plus b times j, and the second one n2 equal to c times r plus d times j. When we multiply them, we get a times c times r squared plus a times d times r times j plus b times c times j times r plus b times d times j squared. Now we know that r squared equals negative 1, but what about r times j and j squared? We need to figure those out. Let's take a step back. Remember we defined j as i times r, but we never defined what r times i is. To move forward, let's assume that i and r are anti-commutative. That means i times r equals negative r times i. That gives us j equals i times r, which is the same as negative r times i. Now let's calculate r times j. That's r times i times r. But i times r is just j, so r times j is r times j. Wait, that's not helpful. Let's try this instead. Since j equals i times r, then r times j equals r times i times r. Now switch the order of the i and r, because the anti-commute r times i is negative i times r, or negative j. So now we have negative j times r. But what is j times r? Well, j is i times r, so j times r becomes i times r times r. That's i times r squared, and r squared is negative 1. So we get i times negative 1, or just negative i. So j times r equals negative i. That means r times j uh, times j equals the negative of negative i, which is just i. Now we have a problem. Our number n only had r and j in it, but now we're seeing i popping up in multiplication. That means our system isn't closed. We need to include i too. Stage 3, expanding the system. Let's add i because r times j equals i. We have to add i to our number system. Now we redefine n as a times r plus b times j plus c times i. Let's check what happens when we multiply. Now we'll get new products like i times j. Let's compute i times j is i times i times r since j is i times r. That gives us i squared times r or negative 1 times r which is just negative r. Now let's check j times i, that's i times r times i, which is the same as i times negative j, which gives us negative i times j. But earlier we saw i times j was negative r, so j times i must be r. We're starting to build a multiplication table here. i times j equals negative r, j times i equals positive r, i times r equals j, r times i equals negative j, r times j equals i, j times r equals negative i. Pretty cool, but we're still not done. Remember how r squared equals negative one? That's a real number, but our current form of n only includes r, j, and i. There's no scalar or real number in there. That means we need one last expansion. To handle that real number result from r squared equals negative 1, we need to add a scalar term. Let's call it s. So now, finally, our number n becomes s plus a time times r plus b times j plus c. It's i. Now we're good. All our multiplications stay inside the system. For example, i times j equals negative r, which we already have r squared equals negative 1, and the scalar s can handle it. This is it. We've built the quaternion algebra. If we rename r to k and reorder the terms a bit, we get the famous quaternion form, a plus b times i plus c times j plus d times k. Instead of jumping straight into three-dimensional space, we're going to build something even more powerful, quaternions, using just pairs of complex numbers. Let's define a new kind of number. We'll call it q, and it's made of two complex numbers. 
z1 plus z2 times r, where z1 is a plus b times i and z2 is c plus d times i. So q becomes a plus b times i plus c plus d times i all multiplied by r. Part 2, multiplying the new numbers. Let's try multiplying two of these numbers together. Say q1 equals z1 plus z2 times r, and q2 equals w1 plus w2 times r. Now multiply them out. We get four terms. First, z1 times w1. Second, z1 times w2 times r. Third, z2 times r times w1. And fourth, z2 times r times w2 times r. The first three are pretty straightforward, but that last one, that's where it gets interesting. Let's focus on that. z2 times r times w2 times r. Now remember, r squared is negative 1, so that whole term simplifies to negative z2 times w2. Cool, that's one part done. But now we have to handle the third term, z2 times r times w1. And here's where things get tricky, because w1 is a complex number. It's u plus v times i, so we expand r times w1. That gives us u times r plus v times r times i. But wait, we haven't said what r times i actually is, so we need to define that next. Let's suppose for now that r and i do commute. That means r times i is the same as i times r. So r times w1 becomes u times r plus v times i times r. Now go back to our full multiplication. We get z1 times w1 minus z2 times w2 plus the term z1 times w2 plus z2 times u, all times r, and finally z2 times v times i times r. But i times r is something we haven't named yet, so let's give it a name. Let's call it j. So j is defined as i times r. That means q can now be rewritten as a plus b times i plus c times r plus d times j. Looks cool. But here's the big question. Does this system actually hold together when we multiply things? Part 4. Verifying closure. Let's put it to the test and check all the products we care about. First, i times r equals j. That's our definition. Next, what about r times i? Let's assume they don't commute. In fact, let's say they anti-commute. That means i times r equals negative r times i. So r times i must equal negative j. Now let's look at r times j. That's r times i times r. We can regroup this as r times i, then times r again. We already said r times i is negative j, so this becomes negative j times r. Now what is j times r? Well, j is i times r, so j times r is i times r times r. Since r squared is negative 1, this becomes i times negative 1, or just negative i. So j times r is negative i, which means r times j is the opposite of that, positive i. Let's keep going. How about i times j? That's i times i times r, or i squared times r, which is negative 1 times r, so negative r, and j times i. That's i times r times i. We can regroup again. i times negative j. That's negative i times j, which is just r. Now j squared j is i times r, so j squared is i times r times i times r. Regroup i times r times i. That gives us i times negative j, or negative i times j, and that equals negative of r. Then multiply that by r again, and we get r squared, which is negative 1. So j squared equals negative 1. Every multiplication stays within our set of four elements, 1, i, r, and j. That means the system is closed. We're not stepping outside the rules. Part 5, final form, quaternions. Now we've got something amazing. Our number q equals a plus b times i plus c times r plus d times j. It's closed under multiplication, and it behaves beautifully. If we rename r as k, just like Hamilton did, then we get q equals a plus b times i plus c times j plus d times k. And the rules are i squared, j squared, and k squared all equal negative 1. i times j equals k, j times k equals i, and k times i equals j. Also, everything is anti-commutative, so i times j equals negative j times i, and so on. This is the full quaternion algebra. And that wraps up quaternions. In the next video, we'll take it even further with quintinions, a five-dimensional number system. Stay tuned.